my name is Trule, the love activist, and welcome to Conversations with a Love Activist. Crazy. Ah, this is so crazy. I've been on uh, the self-awareness journey for 10 years now, and I have seen the power of love to transform, you know, your life. Um, you know, using love as an activism tool to change not just my internal world, but the world around me. I feel like I've lost my way. And so I'm embarking on a self-love-centric heroine's journey. A hero's journey is a psychological term that charts the journey of an individual towards personal growth, transformation, and ultimately self-actualization. Every heroine's journey is enriched by sages that guide the hero through the tricky waters of uh, self-actualization and self-acceptance. I have three, because I need three. I need all the help that I can get. <laughs> I call these sages my council of wise women. This, my beautiful council of wounds is made up of my mother, Nungunlego Koboto, of my life and relationship coach, Shannon Pam, and my integrated healer, Gogo Sophia. And they will be um, equipping me with practical tools to heal in different areas that I hope that you, will, you guys will profit from. First up is my mother, Nungunlego Koboto. Uh, for those who don't know who Nungleko Koboto is, she's the first black woman chartered accountant in South Africa. Um, she was part of a huge merger with um, Koboto and Susan Zalubra Koboto, which became the biggest accounting firm on the continent. My mother is now um, the founder of Awakened, a social movement that aims to end racism and discrimination against women. You know, my mother has been a huge influence on my consciousness journey. She gave me my first um, book called The Road Less Traveled by Dr. Scott Peck. Um, and that ignited this journey of consciousness that I've been on now for 10 years. Crazy. Um, let's get her on the line. Hello, mommy. Ask me. Hi. <laughs> Hi, 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 hi. I'm so blessed to have um, such an easily reachable, huge resource of, of information and, and wisdom in you. And in such a consciousness journey, I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you the road less traveled that Dr. Scott Peck, you know, and the lines that always stay with me is if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And for the first time it hit me, but oh, whatever problem I'm seeing is not for someone else to fix. And if I'm not actively trying to fix whatever is internally happening in my world, then I'm part of the problem. When I went on a journey of self-awareness, you know, what was the moment that um, made you start exploring? Because Tina's Kule, in a very Christian, you know, background where you're not supposed to um, look into other, you know, um, faiths or, or religions or anything like that. So, um, yeah, what, what got you on this, this journey? I was always uh, misunderstood as a person. Mm -hmm. especially around my personality. So people were saying, I'm too hard, I'm this, I'm that. So I, I had a lot of criticism mm -hmm. around myself. And in spite of the fact that I was successful and I had done big things, but I always lived with this criticism. Mm -hmm. So I started then saying, I can't be blaming people for not understanding me when I don't understand myself. Mm. So let me embark on a journey of understanding myself. Mm -hmm. So the journey started just reading books around uh, personality types. Mm -hmm. That was my first venture out. And out of that, 
I then began to understand myself more. Mm. But I mean, the criticism didn't stop, but I was having a better appreciation of myself. Mm-hmm. And then we, we, we had a, a, a team building exercise as partners of Koboto when we established Koboto Inc. Mm. And we did a psychometric test for the first time. Mm. And then they were explaining what an, an introvert is. And that helped me then to appreciate the fact that the fact that I'm quiet, it's fine. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it, I, I don't want to be loud and, and be, you know, um, that kind of personality. I'm, I'm fine being me. Mm-hmm. I was able to manage my own energy. Like, for instance, after a stretch session where you, you've been in a strategy session the whole day and then you have a dinner at night, Mm. I used to make sure that when I get to the venue where the dinner is going to be, I spend 30 minutes of quietness in my car Mm -hmm. before I join them in the dinner. And that used to sustain me the whole evening. I would watch introverts leave early one (laughs) by one. I would laugh at them and say, you see, you know your own energy and manage your own energy. Here am I. I can laugh the whole evening. (laughs) And all of that. So that's how it, it, it really starts. Mm-hmm. As you gain more knowledge, you get hungry for more. And I got to a stage where I was dissatisfied with what the church was teaching me in the sense that I felt there was more out there. Mm. And I could no longer be satisfied with the things that were feeding me. And I decided one day to give myself permission, in spite of the the taboo around exploring outside the church. Mm. I gave myself permission. I said, this is my life. I'm going to take the risk. If I, it turns out to be a big mistake, I will not blame anybody but myself. Mm-hmm. It's the best decision I ever made. <laughs> we are here because of that decision. <laughs> we are having conversations <laughs> with a love activist because of that comment, <laughs> because of that decision. I'm sure Bandaba Abani Dabayazi, you know, um, about the significance of that nine years that you were not, you know, in the public eye, you were not in practice um, in terms of the profession and how much it also, um, that amount of contrast also contributed to, to the wanting more or asking for more, right? Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, about that time and, and the profits um, of that time? And how is it possible that as a human being, I can be smart and stupid, I can be wise and foolish, I can build with one hand and destroy with another? Mm. What would cause that? So that was, it was the curiosity of trying to answer that question. Mm. Then, then that gave me that boldness of making the decision because I needed to find answers and I was not finding them in the church. They are, whatever they were teaching me was too simplistic. I just thought that also this whole notion of we are the only right ones and you've got to, to exercise your, your or practice your spiritual life within these four walls, within this box, I just felt spirituality is far much more than that. Mm-hmm. There was this whole notion of up, upholding the Jewish culture and Jewish religion and all of that more than our, my own culture, for instance, as an, as an African, as a Kosa woman. Mm-hmm. And so I was, I was making decisions about what to discard around the things that the church had taught me. And I didn't want to just discard something if it was relevant because I just felt that this putting Judaism as too much the center of our lives as as Christians, especially in in my own church where I, that I attended, Judaism was the thing. There was a a synagogue in the same street. So I knocked on the door of the the house. And fortunately the rabbi was home. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so I was asking these questions about Judaism and all of that, and I was shocked by the fact that we were saying, you know, don't be curious about Judaism and all of that, because we ourselves were in it, but we don't, we don't know, we don't understand. 
we have, have this burden that God has put upon us as Jews, and uh, you don't want to carry this burden. Yo. But if you want to know more, <laughs> if you want to know more, uh, there's a, a Jewish library. I'll refer you to. And he found the, the guy at the library. I'm sending this lady, not library, a bookshop. Mm. I'm sending this lady, whatever. So I, I found the guy who owned the the, the, the sort of the bookshop. Mm. They're waiting for me. So I, I, I asked the same question. He gave me the same answer. <laughs> I'm following people who do not even know what is going on. Who? Sure. And he said, got five sons, and all of them are rabbis. <laughs> we don't know much. Here's the bookshop. You can find <laughs> books. Don't know much. <laughs> So I, I walked around the bookshop and I found this book. Um, what is it called? Wisdom. But it's about wisdom nuggets by a famous American rabbi. So I, I that out this book that, that attracted me. So I bought this book. And it's the book that carried me during those few months when I was starting to venture out and find my life again. Mm. So it spoke about... God is not looking for puppets. Mm. It's looking for, for people who are going to find knowledge for themselves mm. and don't even accept what you read in the Bible or the, he was talking about their Torah mm. uh, without challenging it and accept mm -hmm. it for yourself when you're ready to accept it and don't follow any leader except those leaders that you feel you can respect. You're not obliged to follow people just because they are saying they are spiritual leaders or they are pastors or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that is the book that gave me the freedom. Wow. So after that, the first book then, remember, they were saying Oprah is a new age and you should listen to Oprah. Yeah. I, Oprah. I, I had these reservations because we are all suspicious about her. So the first book then I bought was New, new yeah. Heaven and New Earth. Yes, New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Mm. Yeah, that's the book that started me on this journey of self-discovery. So that I then explored. Then after that, the internet has been like the most wonderful resource because the spirit will lead you. He knows your answers mm. that you seek because you've been asking these questions. He will lead you to the right material that you are ready for. Mm. Because they say that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm, 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 mm. Another big reason um, or another big inspiration for starting this, this whole journey was early lock, lockdown, won't send it like he links. Um, he links about healing your inner child. He links about feminine energy and how the pandemic is calling us to go inwards and, and to stop and to listen and how we are struggling with stopping and listening. And we were having a conversation about healing the inner child and you were talking about your experience, you know, your childhood experiences and how misunderstood um, you were because your parents are also carrying their own traumas and, and, and. And, 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 Black people, black women are not having these kind of conversations about dealing with childhood trauma, about um, healing, doing shadow work. That was another beautiful link that you sent me, doing shadow work. You know, Tina, the age group here to say, but it's not an intergenerational conversation at all. And so that's why for me, it was important one, to have this kind of uh, conversation in a very African culturalized kind of environment um, around doing this, this um, conscious work. I just wanted to talk a little bit around healing, you know, um, generational trauma. Um, because as much as we have such a, an amazing relationship now, you know, I had a lot of, um, preconceived um, ideas of what our relationship was supposed to look like. And a lot of it was based on, I am the victim of other people's um, actions or lack thereof, and also not understanding my own love language and how 
I, I articulate, you know, um, what love is for me. Um, and I know you also had a, a, a difficult relationship with your mom. Can we have a conversation around, you know, the deep need to heal mother-daughter wounds and what that's looked like for you? Just writing my book has been such a, a, a healing journey also because when you're writing a book, you, you look at things in detail. You, mm-hmm. So I've sort of revisited my childhood and, and I was just shocked and amazed at the kind of trauma that we go through as young people mm-hmm. that asiazi, asiazi, that kind of trauma. So I've been able to, to, to trace the, the trauma and the first one was when I was four years old and oh, my, my younger sister, Notemba, was born. So my older sibling, sister, and Omonde were joking, basically. Yeah, um, when I, well, I'm like a mama. Mama occupied by some old woman. <laughs> And as a four-year-old, you believe this story. Yes. So I, I lived with that trauma for a long time. I used to have a picture of this old woman who gave me to my mom. Mm-mm. And I used to envy my sister for being my mother's child when, when I'm, not, I'm, I'm not my mother's child. Mm-hmm. And, and can you imagine? I mean, that was just a careless joke. But that's where trauma starts building up. Mm. And, and, and so my, my, my second trauma was, that I remember was around seven years, this friction with my mom started where I think she was worried about me because I was imaging as a different personality from my siblings. I was not outgoing, I was quiet. And she was just worried about this. And her response to it was I think Nashem Etumba we had to shake her up. Mm. So she was hard on me. She was saying all sorts of these negative things about me, uh, how I'm not this, why I'm not that, how I'm not that. And as a seven year old, you believe these things. You know, you believe there's something wrong with you. And not understanding love language, and I, I, I saw how it is at the center of childhood traumas. Now I was growing up in a normal family with mm. mother, father, normal. Mm. So the, 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 the source of my traumas were based on my parents not understanding my love language and I'm of course not understanding my love language. Mm. So because my love language is affirmation, umama and Nyugula all the time, criticizing mm. me all the time was talking totally against my love language. Mm. And she was a busy woman. She was a nurse. She was, uh, she also ran a a small business at those years. So again, she was not there. Mm. And quality time. She was not there. My my other language is is quality time. Mm. So, so, you can't even go to ignorance all around. Mm. Mama, things she started, she is, is, is to shake me up and then it's doing worse. I'm, I can imagine I was going more and more into my shell mm. and the more I go into my shell, the more she tries what? harder doing the wrong thing again. So that's how that wounded inner child was born. Mm. Then I believed that I'm not loved, I'm not lovable. The you are criticized because of your personality. So. This whole narrative, you know, there's something wrong with you, grows, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's why I fell pregnant at 17, mm-hmm. because I was looking for love outside, outside my family, because mm-hmm. I couldn't find love in my family. But I didn't know that I had rejection. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this love that I'm looking for in the men is not... They, they, they are incapable of, of fulfilling that need of, of love. It was a broken bone in our car. Mm. Myself and my, my ex-husband were two broken vessels. Mm. So there was no way that love was going to come out of that situation. Mm. 
So you, you just carry this wounded inner child all your life and you don't know that some of your big issues with relationships mm. and, 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 and um, ego is formed around this wounded inner child. So in spite of the fact that I was doing the spiritual work since that time that I'm, I was talking about, but still I, I, I always felt that and the guy for mine, I'm still missing something. I'm still not okay as a person. Mm. And it is sad for me that in spite of my commitment to spiritual work and, and, and all this journey that I had, yeah, spiritual work and, and transformation and all of that. And yes, of course, there was a lot of progress because I was serious about healing myself. I was serious about healing, making sure that my, my family is healed. But I knew that there was still something I'm missing mm. until during this lockdown, I learned about a wounded inner child. And I didn't, it's actually strange how the universe works in terms of synchronicity. Mm. So before that video that I sent you on the wounded inner child, I healed the inner child. The inner child. And then that week or following week, I get this video on the wounded inner child. I'm like, oh, this is what I did last year. And in spite that week, in spite of all of my the spiritual material that I received, I had never heard of healing the wounded inner child or reparenting. I had never heard any of that. So what happened is that I, I then had a conversation with that wounded child. And I could recognize, I've recognized the child before, you know, um, because certain behaviors, you would say, like around rejection, for instance, you'd say, but an adult would not feel like this, you mm -hmm. know? But I never knew what it was. So I had this conversation with this wounded, with my wounded inner child, where suddenly we started a conversation about my mom. Mm. And, she, and she said, she never loved you. And it just came deep from within myself. She never loved me. So I was able to argue about that. But no, that's, that's not true. My mother loved me. Yes, we had our own problems, whatever. It was out of ignorance and so on. And I could feel that bubble. And then when I thought you are done, another one. <laughs> But you're never his favorite. You, you were never her favorite. That shook me because mm. I believed that that I was never her favorite. Mm. So, so you can imagine now that I hesitate a little bit, mm. and then I, I, I think by the spirit, I, although I didn't know anything about a wounded inner child, I just knew this is part of my healing. So I needed to deal with this thing today. So I recovered quickly. And then I said, okay, maybe I was not her favorite, um, but I'm fine with that. I'm actually grateful for the fact that my mother was hard on me because when we spoil life, mm. and she spoiled some of my siblings. So I'm actually glad I was not her favorite because, because she was hard on me. I've been able to be the kind of person that I am. And, um, and in, in the end, I had a relationship with my mom that I was happy with. You know, we did heal the relationship in the end when I started dealing with rejection. And so all of my work on the ego, remember that I was doing it, but because I was dealing with the top, the underlying thing was still there. So it was like everything just came together. Now, you will always have a fragile ego. The ego will always fear. The, the ego will always be uh, comparing things with the past. It's fear is coming from the past. Mm. So I don't think we'll ever be free of the ego. But once that stubborn child is healed, you are just dealing with a fragile ego that you are able to manage. So mm -hmm. it was like freedom, like then I'm a freedom that I cannot explain. And that's why now I have this passion that we have to kill a brokenness in families. Mm. Because younger if a male in a brokenness, yeah, yo. we are going, yeah. even the queen of England, Mm. There's brokenness in that family. So it's not about rich or white or anybody. 
yes, as a country, we've got our own issues around race and, and, and discrimination and all of that and prejudice against women. But the woundedness in the family, you will never have good relationships, love relationships with, without healing your brokenness mm. that came from your family. I, I believe that we are capable of having fulfilling, wonderful relationships as human beings. Mm. I think the two reasons why we don't have is because, first of all, that you get involved with someone that you don't have a connection with. Because mm. as human beings, we are souls, you know, mm. there, is, there must be a, a, a soul-to-soul connection with the person. Uh, so you have to tick that box that you are connected with this person. And you've, you've got to have your own measurements of how to measure that connection because only you can do that. Mm. But the second reason why we can't have relationships is because of brokenness. Mm. I also had the same lie of um, you don't love me because you were working, you know, you were building an empire and now my first love language is quality time. <laughs> so yeah. a child interprets that as this person is avoiding me. And only when I gave birth to Umali Bongwe did I realize how impossible that is. Like, how absurd even the thought of that is because as Iliana says, the person who went and borrowed their body to God to bring you here is the person who doesn't love you. No, mm. you know, and, and for me, that was the first time I started to, to, to heal that, that, that relationship. And Nano Quentin always have this conversation because he's, he always says, you know, um, especially when Umali was much younger, that I'm too hard on her. I'm too harsh with her. And I realized, well, women to women, because we believe that the world is so unsafe, we feel like it's our duty to mm. prepare our children for this unsafe world that's mm. going to try to take and rip them apart. And then mm. you're ripping them apart. <laughs> you know, you're mm. creating that reality. Um, out of fear for them. Mm. So I, I kind of saw that cycle of what Umakulu was trying to do for you and what you were trying to do for me. And I was mm. now doing that with Umani as they walk in. Come in, guys, shame. Let's go in. Hi, Umakulu. Hello, baby. Hi. Hi. Let's go in. She's like, what's on your head? <laughs> you know, the reason why um, it was important to have you as part of this journey, like I had mentioned, um, you know, I'm on a heroine's journey um, of, you know, transformation, birthing my authentic self. Um, and in that journey, the hero always has sages that encourage him, that oh, encourage her and catalyze that journey towards self-actualization. So, you know, I have my council of the wise or my, my wombs, as I call you guys, <laughs> my wise wombs <laughs> that are, are, are walking this, this journey with me. Um, and in particular, I, I was very inspired to be, or, or I saw it as an opportunity to be um, that guinea pig for Awakened, you know, um, to, mm. to actually um, action what you are proposing in the movement of mm -hmm. Awakened. So just tell us a little bit okay. about what Awakened is. I am managing my life such that I don't fall a victim of racism and, and, uh, and prejudice. But I could only manage it in the workplace. Mm. I think in my mind, I thought that because of the things I've done, because I've been a role model to black people and, and to women and inspired a lot of people, that was sort of enough. I've ticked my box. Mm -hmm. you know, I've served my country mm -hmm. and so on. This whole issue of racism and prejudice against women in society is a big issue that is, is beyond my control and all of that. <laughs> and someone else, you know, Dan Kuswam Udata, Udata was just such a fighter. Mm -hmm. And he taught me about you know, fighting your battles and, and always seeing victory in, in battle. 
so I sort of always said I count my battles. I don't get involved in battles that I have no chance of winning. That that was my philosophy. In life. <laughs> so for me, this daughter, I think, was a was a, a, a battle that I had no control. It was out of, outside my control. Mm. But to get to a stage where, first of all, you are also living with racism and uh, in, in society, racism especially, not just against women, I suppose someone out there who's prejudiced against me as a woman, I never cared about that because, I mean, you're not going to stop me doing the things that I want to do. Mm. But racism, it was something that I lived with. And my attitude towards racism was always uh, let it slide. You know, let it slide so when you encounter um, that manager at the restaurant who ignores you. So I'm I would just ignore that because it takes too much energy to deal with it. So I didn't want to spend energy dealing with it. So you just sort of let it slide, let it slide. I lived that life. But I got to a stage before I awakened where I felt, no, I think this thing continues because we, we just allow it. We let it slide. Because for me, whatever, whatever, his attitude or her attitude towards me doesn't define who I am. It, it did affect me at, at an emotional, spiritual level as a human being. Mm -hmm. As we know, disregard is the worst thing. Mm. So I got tired of us rehashing the same messages, talking about this problem. It's never going away. It's 26 years now for our democracy. We are still talking about racism and prejudice against women and, and, and discrimination. And I was always bothered by the fact that our struggle is dependent on white people changing or, or men changing towards women. Mm. And I never liked the feeling of helplessness that it gave us, that you are helpless until these people change. So I, I always struggled with that. So during this lockdown, and then I had received from last year that I must write my book. But although people had been putting pressure on me to write the book, first of all, I never thought I'm a writer, so how am I going to write a book? <laughs> Secondly, I had had a life of ups and downs. I didn't want to write another inspirational book. There are so many of them. I wanted people to benefit from the ups and downs I've experienced in life. But I didn't know how I would approach that kind of book. Mm. So during the lockdown, I just received that I must just have the courage to write my book and, and share my story as it is, the, all the ups and downs, because people can then learn from how I dealt with my ups and downs in life. Mm. So I was now excited about my book project. As I was now planning to, to write the book, Black Lives Matter took a turn in America. Mm. And again, the narrative was, they have to release us. They have to release us. That's when I got angry. I mean, there was just a deep anger within myself to say, no, we cannot be waiting for people to release us. We are not powerless in the situation. Mm. So that's when I said, it is time for me to get involved uh, in dealing with this issue of racism and prejudice against women. And I don't want to be involved in the broader struggle. The broader struggle can continue. We'll win it whenever we can win it. But if you focus on the individual, because the individual has the power to change their own life. Mm. They have the power to change their own beliefs. Because remember, if the races are saying we are such and such people, we submit to that and we become that. Mm -hmm. If men are saying we are such and such, we, we submit to that and we become that. Mm. So, but the individual can take responsibility for their own transformation, their own healing, Mm. Of, of the wounds of racism and prejudice. And uh, we can help people who can find their authentic self. Because can you imagine if, if we are functioning in the world according to the labels that have been given by white people and by men, the, we're actually robbing the world. Yeah. We are robbing the world. So that's what I want to focus on in Awakened, focus on the individual to take back their power to free themselves from these limiting beliefs. And I believe that one by one, mm. as people get free, 
get healed and they find their authentic self, we will change the world for real now. Mm. Because once you found your true self, once you find your authentic self, no one can take that away from you. We live in such a, a culture that glorifies victimhood. You know, and I, I, I don't want to lie. Nah, Jenny Yamne victimhood has been a very long one. Victimhood is nice. It's nice to be able to say, all my problems are because my mom didn't do this. And if she had done this, then my life would be different. And she must change. And when my mom changes, then my life will be fulfilling and I'll be able to do all these great things that I want to do. But then you get tired of waiting. <laughs> you get mm. tired of Ugulida. But Zolinda, long do I change until when? The only mm. person I have control over here. Now, Dim. Omnia no omnia and quasum ukum ukum controller too. So, you know, it sounds like that's exactly what, you know, awakened is about. It's about um, us taking that responsibility and loving ourselves into healing. And it's mm. got a ripple effect. Really what um, Conversations with a Love Activist is about is ch- charting this journey um, from victimhood to victoryhood, you know, um, of powerlessness to embracing my authentic power. See, um, yeah, I'm so overwhelmed actually by, by what God is doing and I'm so grateful um, for the lockdown because had it not been for the lockdown, I wouldn't have had the courage to, to um, step up to my calling. And, um, you know, it's so, <sighs> when I found my Bible, Pai Houghton, my Bible that I used to carry at after, and I opened mm. it to Ephesians 4, and it said, um, live a life worthy of your calling. You know, mm. um, Jesus said that. And it just literally my, my crown chakra and my, and my third eye became like, they went crazy. I'm like, what's going mm. on? What's going mm. on? You know, um, and so this is what this is all about, is the fact that um, mm. I'm taking that step to live a life worthy of my calling. And it's not this beautiful, sexy journey. It's going to be messy. You know, old mm. wounds are going to get inflamed. Things that I had hidden from myself mm. are going to come up. But... Mm. I know that I have a safe space to do that. I have, you know, my own mother <laughs> who's mm. with me. I have, you know, Tulu, mm. I have Shannon, I have old, I have Quentin, because Quentin's gonna be part of this journey as well. This yeah. is a love act in and of itself. So thank you, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. A nation is built brick by brick, and each brick is, is a person. And so I'm 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 trying to polish that this brick that is me to get to the gym that is inside with conversations with the love activists. And I'm hoping that as you see me do the work, as you see the practical steps, because that's the thing, people can say, love yourself. But what does that look like? What do I do to love myself? This Tandanjani, you know, um, I'm hoping that I'm choosing myself. I'm loving myself so that my family can benefit, so that God can do through me what I want him to do for me.